Well Child podcast. We are so happy to have each of you and couldn't be more grateful for all the positive feedback and encouragement. Keep telling us what you want to learn about and we will make it a point to incorporate it in our ongoing list of exciting topics. Now we know we say this at every episode, but this time we really, really mean it, that today's topic is extra special to the both of us. We as pediatricians spend a lot of time not only covering physical health concerns, but as citizens of this society and shared human experience, one of our passions is to talk about things like activism, feminism, gender and racial equality, and all the topics that impact us today and will continue to impact the next generations. So how do we introduce these topics to our children and how do we empower them to break the cycle and change the systemic issues that are so prevalent? Unless we understand the nuances of these messages that we give to our children daily, we can't expect their experiences to be different than ours. Our guest today is the perfect person to help us navigate these conversations. Her name is Jamia Wilson, and we are honored to have her on our podcast. She is a feminist, an activist, a writer, a speaker, a movement builder. She, her list of accomplishments will take us the entire podcast. So I'm going to give you a brief overview. She is the executive editor of Random House and was formerly the director and publisher of the Feminist Press at the City University of New York and former VP of programs at the Women's Media Center. She was the youngest director in the press's history, as well as the first woman of color to head the organization. Prior to joining the Feminist Press, she was executive director of Women Action and Media and a staff writer for Rookie Magazine. She has been the leading voice on women's rights issues for over a decade and a powerful voice in the social justice movement. Her work has been featured in numerous outlets like the New York Times, The Today Show, CNN, Elle, BBC, Rookie, Glamour, Teen Vogue, and The Washington Post. She is the author of one of our favorite children's books, Young, Gifted, and Black, The Introduction and Oral History and Together We Rise, Behind the Scenes at the Protests Heard Around the World, Step Into Power, 23 Lessons on How to Live Your Best Life, Big Ideas for Young Thinkers, and so, so many more. At a true next generation leader, she has graced the stage at events such as TED Women, Netroots Nation, The Facing Race, and travels across the U.S. and beyond to colleges, campus to talk about race, feminism, spirituality, leadership, and so much more. We're so honored to have you and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I love what you're doing in the world and I'm honored to join you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do you mind um, telling our audience a little bit about yourself from your point of view? Um, You know, Diana did such a good job of introducing you, but we would love to know it, kind of your story through your eyes. Thank you. And you, thank you for your warm introduction. I am the daughter of Johnny and Frida. I am the granddaughter of Ethel Lee and Georgia and Albert and John Lester. And I come from the Carolinas originally. It's my origin story. Uh, And I'm the descendant of sharecroppers and also the descendant of educators. And I grew up as an expat in Saudi Arabia. So I consider myself a little bit of a third culture kid, although um, I'm not a kid anymore. I still have that identity have a global perspective, uh, still consider myself a Southerner also because so much of that is how I was raised and informs my sensibilities and my values, my cooking and my hospitality. And I am a feminist. I've just always, in addition to my faith um, and being raised in a strong faith tradition in my family, I was also raised by civil rights activists and active professors who had been active during the civil rights movement in the South and the children of civil rights activists. So it was just always a part of my family culture to get involved and to take action as well. So that's how I would describe myself. I'm also a writer. So I edit by day and I work to champion others' stories, but I also write my own. Um, I consider myself a storyteller. I am a writer, I'm an editor, I'm a speaker, and I just love story and I love the tradition of story as it's been passed down to me. So I 
think books are such a fabulous way to make sure that we leave our imprint long after we're gone. And I like to amplify the voices of people who've often been left out of the conversation, that we don't hear from as much as we need to. And, and that's also who I think about a lot when I'm writing my children's books specifically, but when I write books for readers of all ages. Exactly. I think um, as both of us as women of color, you know, we did not have these role models. We didn't have this representation. And I know a lot of people are trying to change that conversation currently. And so we, we, we have a lot of parents that are actually sensitive to a lot of this. And we, um, you know, are trying to do our part to help parents as they navigate um, talking to their children about the things that are happening in the world around them, you know, and just to describe things like what does feminism mean, you know, and how do you explain such nuanced concepts, um, you know, that have been through history, you know, uh, how do you ex how do you explain that to a child? I know it's it's a long process, but wanted to get your opinion about what feminism means to you, and and how should parents talk about it? This is music to my ears because my latest book it's about to come out any minute now, and by the time that we air this segment, will be out in the world. It's uh, now available for pre order, and this book is called this book is feminist. And this book seeks to explore the very question that you're receiving, the very question that we're all exploring around. What does feminism mean? But I specifically wanted to lay out some of the myths and some of the tensions around our global conversation about feminism and also lay out what I understand feminism to be through my own personal experiences and what, where the definition of feminism even originated, because people were doing things that we would now consider feminist before the term was coined in the 1800s, um, and contextualizing that with facts, with cultural history, with some fun voices and quotes from people around the world and diverse people of all sizes, abilities, backgrounds, experiences to really kind of lay it all out and to say there are different approaches to how we get to what this word feminism means to a lot of people. And then prompting the reader with all of that information to say, what does feminism mean to you now that you have received all this information? What does feminism look like to you? What does feminism have the possibility of being if you don't think we've attained that yet? And for me, it's feminism the question. I proudly call myself a feminist, but I also understand why there are people who have questions about it because of the limitations of some people who called themselves feminist throughout history, whose vision wasn't expansive enough to include all people, including the people on this podcast right now, who didn't understand the global nature of feminism, didn't understand that race and class have a relationship with feminism, etc. So in the book, I go through themes and talk about health and wellness as a theme, relationships. We talk about safety. We talk about justice. We talk about education and we talk about equality. And then we go into each of those things deeply and look at what feminism has meant and what it can mean. And to me, what I discovered in my own exploration of this topic was that feminism, like any other ideology, is evolving as it should be. And we as feminists are always in a place of evolution, which is why I love to have conversations with my readers. And some of the folks who had advanced reader copies have already gone back to me. And I've loved that feedback. There was a young bookstagrammer who said, I love the book, but there is one term that I wish you would use because I feel like it's more accurate to the experience of people who feel like they are limited by the duality of genders as stated in dominant culture. And they said that rather than non-binary, they would have preferred if I'd used misogyny affected to describe their experience in the world. And I said, thank you. I appreciate you sharing that experience with me because now I'm going to be thinking about that and I'm going to be talking about gender in a more expansive way when I'm 
talking to many different people in the world who may have the same sorts of questions that this person had for me. And that's what I want the book to do. I want people to feel comfortable to say, oh, this is how people are talking about things. These are the terminologies that are being used, but I experience it in this way. And this is how we should make it even more expansive and even more inclusive. So it's really an invitation to feminism, but also an invitation to evolve feminism as it should be. That is, that's so insightful. And I love that. And I also love that you are open to uh, feedback from your audience, which, um, you know, we can relate to that a little bit. You know, what's interesting when you were talking about it, I was reflecting a little bit at the same time about myself and Anna's journey. Sorry, Anna, if I'm speaking on your behalf, but I feel like I've earned the right. <laughs> but um, both of us, you know, would consider ourselves feminists, of course, and both of us um, might have been brought up with strong female role models in our mothers, but we're never educated about feminism. And so I feel that as women, non-white women um, who, who identify this way, a majority of our life was just surviving this world and not having the time to reflect, uh, but just surviving it, identifying as a feminist and just trying to survive in that world, basically. But then now, you know, as an, I'm, a, I'm in my 40s now, it's amazing how uh, the idea and the concept of intersectional feminism was brand new to me you know, and that the idea of what that means and how complex it can be and all the intricacies, that's something I'm just uncovering now. And um, I'm wondering, again, like if you have any advice for moms like me who, you know, again, spent the majority of their lives just being part of it, but not really being awoken enough, I suppose, is kind of the, the word that I'd, I would use maybe, but now are trying to not repeat the cycle for their children. So I, one of the things I'm, I hope to do with my books is to be a partner to parents because I don't, I don't have children of my own at this point in my life, but I do have children in my community who I love so much and children in my family. And I have two children who I'm proud to call my godchildren and who I'm an auntie to and I spoil very much. And when I think of them, when I work on these projects, but I also think of their parents who are really busy, like you said, surviving this world, putting food on the table, getting them to school, getting them support and helping them navigate this increasingly complicated planet that we live on. So my books, yes, are written with a voice and a vision and intention for young readers, but they're also very much to be supports for parents. And that's why Big Ideas for Young Thinkers and Step Into Your Power specifically were also very uh, prescriptive in certain ways, but also giving prompts and questions so that parents could use those as tools to engender conversation with the young peoples in their lives and that any caretaker of young people would be able to say, oh, why don't we do this activity together? Why don't we ask ourselves these questions together? And with this book, I very much had this in mind and I had my parents very present in this book. Uh, this book is feminist. Uh, it, I love because my mother sadly is deceased, but my but the illustrator of this book is feminist, Aurelia Durant, is this amazing French illustrator. And she brought my mother back to me in beautiful illustrations and pictures of our family unit, and then created some visionary tableaus of us marching in a march with masks on. And my mom wasn't here for coronavirus, but they br she brought her to the present to show that those lessons that I was taught by her and through her leadership and through her connection, those go on and that will live on in the book. So I share that too, because parents were very much in the forefront of my mind as I thought about how do I include the ancestors and parents who I have, my dad is still with us, um, in this book as well. And so I, I had a very strong intention to make this book one that parents would feel comfortable exploring with the young people in their lives. And I know several parents who have already bought the book to have this conversation uh, with their children to say, okay, why don't you read this, this chapter with me and then we can do the prompts together. We can ask ourselves the question, what does feminism mean to you? What does justice 
and equality look and feel like to you. And I include some stories in the book too to kind of normalize these conversations between parents and young people. So for example, my first memory or my first strong memory of sexual and street harassment was me witnessing my mom being sexually harassed on the street in Saudi Arabia. And my mom and I were by ourselves walking really close to our home. And there was a man who approached my mom in an inappropriate way. But the language he used wasn't language that I yet understood, was charged in an inappropriate way. And so I talk about all of that and the vulnerabilities of that. But what I learned from her about how we were unsafe in this section about street harassment and public safety, and I show statistics about different global responses to street harassment and then prompt the reader to be able to have conversations about why is it hard for us in society due to stigma to have these conversations? What does it mean to have safe space for us to be able to walk and be in our families without being objectified? What does it mean when you see your parent in that experience? What does that make you think about yourself and your body? So um, I'm, I hope and I would love to hear what you think when you read the book. I, I hope that parents will see this as an accompaniment and something that does take some labor off their shoulders, but also something that uh, will feel relieving. And with having you both here, I just have to say, I thought a lot about health because that's a big part of how I came into my feminist awakening. And so I talked a lot about that too, because I also want readers to feel like the way that I felt, that I always felt like I could talk to my parents about what was going on with my body um, at a very young age. And it started young for me because a pediatrician diagnosed my ocular issues before ophthalmologists noticed it. That was a pediatrician who caught it, this congenital issue that I had. And so I had to have these conversations really early on with my parents about how are we going to adapt? How are we going to adjust my education? How are we going to help me navigate the world in a monocular way, right? So so I'm just excited that you said that because it, that's very much present in the book. And this is a book that can be read by young readers by themselves, but it's also a book. And that's why I say that it's, it's okay if parents think, oh, my child might be younger than what the age is that's listed here because it's broken down in such a way that you can pick and choose the pieces and grow with the book. You can show the graphics, the timelines, you can show the quotes without digging into some of the other content that you don't feel that your children are ready for. Yeah, I, I love that so much. There's so many pearls of wisdom there, but what I really, really you know, resonated with was first using storytelling in books to have these really difficult conversations, which is so important. And, and, and I think a powerful tool for parents. The other part that I love what you said was talking about how you're an auntie and you empower, because I'm, I'm also an aunt and a godmother. And, and I love that because parents can really use the other people in their life to take that load off. You know, when you send, you know, when you go with your goddaughter or godson and you take them to new experiences and you have another influencer in their life that's having these conversations, I think it really takes that burden off of parents and then you get a new perspective. So empowering parents to be surrounded by other feminists and other activists and, and people that can bring that insight when they're so busy. Um, I think that's so powerful and that's so understated, you know, in our society. And so I really, really appreciate you um, really pointing that out because we, we put so much on parents, you know, and, and a big reason why me and Sammy did this podcast is because we were seeing a lot of mommy guilt and daddy guilt and shaming because all of this advice that we give, whether it's healthcare, whether it's how to raise children, how to be well, this is all an added stress for parents, you know? And so we see parents every day going through the same experience and we wanted to be there telling them, listen, we're all in the same boat. We're all feeling these pressures. And this is not to feel 
extra pressure. This is not to say that you have to have all these conversations, you know, within a certain span of time that you can use resources around you and people around you um, and just be cognizant of the messages that they're getting, you know. Um, but I really wanted to ask you about your book, um, just how the Young, Gifted, and Black in particular. Um, how did you come to, uh, to write that book and what was your, what was your main goal, I guess, um, with writing that book for children? I, you know, I was just talking today with Andrea Pippins, who is the illustrator for that book, and we've done several books together. And we had been following each other for years and connecting in the blogosphere at that time, which feels really dated that I'm saying it that way, but that was what was happening for many years before that. And then we were brought together by an amazing editor, Katie Flint, who had been at Quarto, uh, at uh, Quarto Publishers about the possibility of working on a project together. And we were super excited to work with each other on this project and to conceptualize what it would mean to do a book about Black heroes from around the world with a global outlook and to do a book in such a way that it would be super visual, telling stories in bold color, but also talking about the heart of what each change maker was interested in as a young person and how that influenced the overall trajectory of their lives. And we did all of that virtually and it was amazing. We just were in concert and harmony with each other about this book being a love letter to the next generation. And we even, we talked about that today about other projects we work on together that there's just a lot of trust there in each other's vision and intention and what we're drawn to and the integrity of that. And I feel like I couldn't have asked for more uh, beauty in terms of how that shines through. I trust Andrea to enliven the images of the great people who've inspired us and to tell the story in ways that will make me marvel even more than I already do. And I marvel already at her art and she really trusts me to identify and explore stories with intention as well. And so I think that's been the magic, but it was really about the collaboration for me and wanting to work with her and work with that team, but then also, uh, a knowledge that this would be something that the next generation would have that I didn't feel like I had and that it would inspire other people too to do similar books. Now we're starting to see more of them, but that was a big hope for myself in terms of really believing if you think that you want to see media in the world, yes, it's important for us to get the big media companies to be accountable to making media that shows the diversity of who we are, but it's also something that's within our power to create our own media and create media that aligns with the truth of what we know about our communities. And I really was drawn to the idea of also in an industry that is so, so, so monochromatic, such as publishing, and that's changing, but we still have a long way to go, that I wanted to be a part of a project that had a Black illustrator and a Black writer and to show our readers that not only can we tell the story, we can design the story, we can be a part of various parts of the editorial process. And um, I think that's important for our communities and I think it's important for all people to see that we can also tell our own stories, paint our own stories into existence. Um, and that was that was just really important to me. So I have been overwhelmed. And I think the thing that has been the most exciting is to see how this book has resonated with people beyond the Black community. And we knew that there would be people in our lives who were going to be excited about the book who wanted to also say, yes, this Black history is our history. It's, it's human history. But I have been blown away by the support and reception of this book. And I think what makes me feel excited about the future is that young people really understand how asinine racism is. And what is really cool to me is that I will go to schools 
in London, in Manchester. I'll go to schools in Westchester, New York, or in the Bronx. And I will see kids of all different backgrounds, South Asian, white, Latinx, black, saying, I want to hear about Muhammad Ali. I want to hear about Maya Angelou. I want to hear about Matthew Henson and his exploration in Antarctica. And that is exciting to me. And then, you know, just in terms of us needing more diverse books, it's also been exciting to receive letters from young people, such as one I received from a young Asian child in Texas that said, Misty Copeland is my favorite. I'm too busy reading about her in your book to write you a long letter, but I want you to know that you should put me in Young, Gifted, and Asian because I'm going to be president one day. And I just <laughs> love her and That's was amazing. amazed and got my friend to go back to her mom to say, yes, and you should help me write that. Like, I want to help introduce you to my publisher so you can write that. <laughs> um, so I just, I'm just really excited about that. I think it's time. It's been time. And we need more books like this about all of us. And it was just really exciting to be a part of this project and uh, stay tuned, watch this space. Um, you know, I've always said that it's our hope to follow that book up at some point, and I think it will happen. So, um, you know, I don't want to jinx it, but I'm still wanting to hear from people about mm -hmm. who they didn't see in the first version that they want to see in the next, mm -hmm. and it may happen. Yeah. How exciting. How, how amazing is it to get that response from a little reader, you know, across the country? That's just amazing. This is why we do what we do, right? To get that kind of feedback. That's just, that's just amazing. But this is a good opportunity while we're talking about children's books. Do you have other favorite ones that you love that you can recommend to our listeners? Because we try to recommend them through our social media, but I would love to get your recommendations too. Oh my gosh, I would love to. So, you know, I also, one of the reasons that I did this work and is because I always said, even when I was thinking I was going to be a grassroots organizer for the rest of my life, back when I started out working in Planned Parenthood years ago, I had had on my vision board that I wanted to write a children's book. I said, I want to write one because I feel like they're important. And I grew up loving children's books and they shaped my thinking and expanded my imagination. Little did I know that years later that would shift into something else. So I've always kept my own library of children's books. Even from childhood, I have a lot of my books and then I have books that I buy as an adult. So I can say as an active consumer of children's books and now as someone who has edited and published children's books by other authors, I can recommend some good ones. So one I'd like to recommend is one that we published at Feminist Press when I was there. I'm really proud of this book. And its name is How Mamas Love Their Babies. It's a beautiful picture book. And it really celebrates the ways that diverse mamas support their children through labor and love. And it's for ages four and up. It's a gorgeous book. And every child can find something that makes them feel connected to the mama figure in their life. And I love it. I love that I have friends who have mamas who are pilots and they can see their mamas who's, who are pilots there, mamas who are doctors, mamas who work at home, mamas who are in domestic work, mamas who labor in other ways. And it's just one of my favorite books and it's just gorgeous and uh, a, a very special book. So another one um, is called Ladder to... So another book that I love is Ladder to the Moon. And it's by Maya Sotaro Ng. And it's illustrated by Yui Morales. And this book illuminates the love a child can feel for an ancestor who transitioned before they were born. And it teaches us that love is limitless in time and space. And I think of how I never met my great-grandfather, but I feel like I know him through the stories of others, through the photos, through my ears <laughs> um, that he shared, that it's kind of a distinct thing I've seen in everyone. And 
this is just a really beautiful book. Um, and fun fact, I believe that um, the author of this book is Barack Obama's half sister, I think, which is just yes. really cool. Yeah. Um, so I love that book. Um, a is for activist. Yes. is one of my I favorites. Love mm -hmm. I love it. And I love it in Spanish. I love it in English. And Inosanto Nagara is one of my favorite illustrators. Mm -hmm. It was written by Martha Gonzalez. Uh, Vashti Harrison wrote Liter yes. Little Leaders. I love um, that one too. So beautiful. And I've done several events with Vashti and she's amazing and just an amazing illustrator and author and talking about breaking barriers and, and igniting change. And I also love her as a role model for Black children, also children of Indian descent. Um, Vashti is Black and Indian. And I think it's really important for representation for people to know that there are many people out in the world who can, who represent them, who are doing this work. And so that's another reason why I love um, for the readers of our books to know that Andrea Pippins, our illustrator, is Afro-Brazilian. And we've had some really exciting um, Brazilian readers of our Portuguese edition as well to know that their stories are connected to her story. Um, I also love the Little People Big Dreams series. And those were edited by the editor who did Young, Gifted, and Black. Um, and there are so many of those I love, but some of my favorites include the Frida Kahlo, the Anne Frank, the David Bowie, the Dolly Parton, and the Maya Angelou. And those Little People Big Dreams books are just so powerful. I have a little con a collection in my house as well. And uh, finally, Queer Heroes. And that book is by Arabelle Sicardi, who was working with me at Rookie and just an amazing, amazing author as well. And that's a really powerful one as well. I love those. Those are such great recommendations. I have read several of those and, and we share a few of those, but there was some new ones there that I can't wait to share on our social media and to go read myself. Thank you so much. And we kind of, me and Sammy also connected um, with, you know, children's books and writing in general, because she loves to write and I like to illustrate too. So that was one of our little bucket list items. Maybe in the future, we'll get that opportunity to do because you're right. It's just, it's a, it's just a special way to express and it's just a special way to kind of leave an imprint, like you were saying. I love that so much. One other question I have, I know I have so many questions for you, and I, I promise I'll <laughs> let you carry oh, on great. with your busy, busy, busy life. But um, I wanted to get your opinion because currently, as you know, in the media, in the news, um, you know, social media has made the world a lot smaller. Um, children in general are growing up quicker because they have access to, you know, this global network of information. And so a lot of them are, are really smart and intuitive and, and, you know, have all this information, but their little minds also can't handle all of that information. And, and, and so we're seeing, you know, high rates of teen depression, teen anxiety, um, because, of just this overload, you know? And so it's a challenging time, I think, for parents and aunties and uncles to figure out um, how to filter some of this information, to filter the news. There's a lot of things that are charged and political in our, in our media and in our social media. And so how, I know this is a whole podcast in itself, uh, but how would you suggest that parents go about talking about things like racial injustice and, and gender um, and equality and, and just some of the, the dreary news that we're just exposed to constantly. I think it's especially right now, you know, I just, the year we've been through, the grief, I think kids are so smart and also resilient. Yeah. And I think it's so important for us to really trust in that and to invite them in the age appropriate ways to participate in the hard things too. To participate in the grief, the reflection, the mourning, and to know when certain conversations are hard for us to have as adults. I think that that vulnerability is something that children appreciate, the authenticity of that, but it also teaches and uh, helps create self-aware adults. And 
yes, it's important for us to help kids feel safe, supported, and protected. But I think it's also okay for them to know that mistakes can be made by adults, that we can sometimes be fearful, that we can sometimes not have all the answers and be unsure, that we can be uncomfortable with certainty and that we can be stressed out too, and that we can ask for help when we need it and model that for the young people in our lives. I saw my friend Courtney Martin wrote something beautiful about fathers who go to therapy and an ode to fathers who go to therapy. And I was thinking about how I have written about how it makes me sad that there is a stigma in my community that I grew up in and how my own father would never do it um, and even questioned it when I was talking about it for myself. And my dad is a smart, educated person who always got me what I needed when it came to health and all of those things. But when it came to therapy, there was this stigma in our family, in our community, some of it historic that led him to kind of shut down around that. And I have thought about what would it have looked like in a world where he would have felt comfortable getting that kind of support. I want that for him in a year like this. I want that for him in some of the losses that he has had over the past few years. And so I, I really, what I hope for, for parents is for parents to do that work and healing themselves and modeling that to children, but then also to use resources like this podcast, use resources like great books, like the ones we're talking about, to be a part of demonstrating to children that growth is always powerful and positive. When I learned that, and I think my mother was just so good at teaching me that, um, that changed my life that I'd say, oh, you know, I, I had a bad day and this thing was hard and that's not fair and this is terrible. And her saying, yes, but what did you learn or what did you gain or how did you somehow grow? How did you step into your power? That's how I got the title because she would always say, step into, how did you step into your power today? And I didn't always appreciate that when it was said to me, but now it's really helped me exercise that muscle of being able to show up for people in my lives, including the little people in my life, to say, okay, that hurt, but how did we grow? Yeah. Um, how did this grow us? And it doesn't mean that we can't still sit with the hurt. It doesn't mean we're sweeping it under the rug or toxically trying to gloss over something that wasn't good, but how did we grow? How did we somehow learn something new that helps us come back to this with more knowing, more strength, more force, more of a sense of forgiveness for ourselves, compassion for ourselves and others. Um, that's what I'm hoping for. And I'm, I'm just hoping that, especially right now, kids will be taught. My hope is that children will know that it is completely normal to be going through a wide range of emotions during this time we're in, that it's completely normal during a time where everyone's talking about reopening to have a lot of different mixed feelings about what it means to have a new normal, that we have to rebuild in a sense and that takes some time. And for some of us, we might want to jump right in the water and some of us might want to dip in a toe and that all of that is okay and that we need to kind of move with grace for each other. That's what I really want for kids to really feel comfortable to say, if you feel like you're not comfortable yet, that's okay. And if you feel like you do really miss your friends and you want to have more engagement, that's okay too. That this wide range of ways that we will need to approach coming back to whatever the new normal is, mm -hmm. that all of our different ways and even some of the insured awkwardness that will come and has already mm -hmm. come, that those are all a part of the process and the process will grow us. That's what I really want for all of us and for young people. Yeah, no, that's so insightful. And I, I just wanted to say that what you said about there being strength in vulnerability, I think is so important, not only for parents and for caregivers, but even for healthcare professionals and doctors and pediatricians. Um, I find that the approach that I've had to take for a lot of the teens and preteens that are trying to navigate some of the feelings that they're having is to really come from a place of relatability 
and understanding because you know at this age their problems are their problems they're they're unique to them um and it's it's hard for us as parents and, and people that have seen the world through different times uh to sometimes relate to the the struggles of of the teenage years and to really understand how they're receiving all this information you know and i love how you talked about normalizing therapy um not only for the women of your life but especially for the the male role models because i think that's so so important and even as a physician a lot of times when we're talking to our little patients you know if we we're often talking at them you know we're talking at them saying listen you know we really think you need therapy we really think and and that approach rarely ever works you know a lot of times i've had i've seen success when i say listen i know exactly what you're going through i have been there i had to see a therapist you know when i was at that age or older you know i and i'm going and i was going to be a doctor but i realized that at that time that really helped me you know and so coming from a place of vulnerability of sharing i think that's really a tool that parents should use because it uh, it it makes them more relatable it gives children permission to quote unquote fail or go through their own struggles because um especially as women of color i mean i think i'm recognizing this now in life that you know we've had to always strive for that excellence to get where we are right we've always had to overachieve and um to be able to get that uh, to get to that position so the so to do the self work and to give ourselves those breaks um you know it takes a lot of time and introspection to get to that point and 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 we can't expect kids in their teens to do that right away you know um and so just like we normalize going to the doctor you know yearly we have to normalize mental health care too so i'm so happy that you mentioned that because um that's something we're talking about every day So thank you. I'm so glad. I think I think it's so important and I you know I remember and you have such a amazing job and I just remember the sadness I felt when I had to stop going to my pediatrician and they transitioned me. Yes. <laughs> Because I had such a close relationship with him and you know had grown up with him. I mean, luckily he's still in my life. I'm really good friends with his son and he was a family wow. friend. Um but you know when and i think that's also just kind of been interesting for him you know for he's known me since i was born but i think that it is um it's such it's so interesting too because you see the development of a child and you know that they trust pediatricians you know that's one of your most early trusted relationships so i love that young people have you thank you before we kind of wrap this up because we know you're a, a busy lady any last minute uh words or tips for or for parents um as they go through this parenthood journey and and any other advice that you have for them i just want to say you're doing amazing work you are enough there's no perfect way to do this and what i know from my readers is that we have a really smart active and compassionate next generation that has a really strong vision for how we can make things better for all of us and i think that has a lot to do with the parenting that they're receiving and so that makes me feel really hopeful this conscious parenting this conscious parenting and the strategy and intention that people are taking to really build in healthier ways with this generation one of the things that my mother told me before she passed away um and it really stuck with me because it was in you know those precious moments in palliative care where we knew there wasn't a lot of time but we didn't know how much time she had said you know i tried to do the best i could when i was here every generation does what they can to make things better and that's what we should do every generation should make it a little bit better for the next i hope that's what you'll do and the next and the next and the next will do that and i think about that conversation all the time and the wisdom that came in it for her at that time in that juncture of saying i did what i could while i was here it's up to you to do what you could can while you're here for the next and to make sure that the next generation also knows that it's up to them yes. to make sure that that goes on and uh, i think that that's 
the charge that we have um, to make sure we give the best inheritance to the generations that come back to us, that come after us, but then also, you know, to break some of the ties that no longer work for us and some of the chains that no longer work and open the doors for new ways too that are healthier moving yes. forward. Yeah, no, definitely. And the fact that they're listening to this kind of podcast or they're waiting for your future books to come out means that they're already, um, you know, empowered and motivated to even just self-reflect and make that change. So we always give a lot of kudos to our listeners because just the fact that you've taken time out to learn about this stuff means that you're already doing what, you know, what you can, which is just really amazing and should be given a lot more credit. But thank you so much for, for taking the time out and thank you for all the work that you've done and that you continue to do. Um, and you've talked about your book that you're working on now. Anything else new in the works? And, and, and tell our listeners where they can find you um, to learn more. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to join you all today. You can find me at jamiawilson.org. You can follow me on Twitter at Jamia W or Instagram at Jamia A. Wilson. And this book is feminist is coming out in this summer and you can get it wherever books are sold around the world. I like to say the best place you can get it is your favorite independent bookstore and bookshop.org is a great place to get it too because when you support bookshop.org, they're supporting independent bookstores. Um, and parents, if you can, and if you're able, one thing that I like to ask, if I may, is if you buy one copy, buy another copy for a child in your life who might not be able to have someone buy them a copy of a book or to donate to your local library. I try to do that myself. And it's really, really amazing how much I'll hear from young people who get books through shelters or through libraries um, and are touched by these stories. So if you are able, get one for your child and get one for another child who might not be able to have one bought for them. I love that so much. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.